with a disability. This year's theme is removing barriers to create uh, an inclusive and accessible society for all. And of course, here in Australia, we've taken an important step towards achieving that with the creation of the Nas National Disability Insurance Scheme, the National Disability Insurance Agency to deliver that scheme. Shortly to mark the event and talk about the continuing rollout of the new disability care arrangements, uh, we'll hear from the Assistant Minister for Social Services, uh, Senator Mitch Fifield. But first I'd like to invite Senator Fifield to announce the winner of this year's Urala Media Award for excellence in reporting the challenges, the stereotypes that unfairly sometimes define people with a disability. Please welcome Senator Fifield. Well, thank you, Laurie, and uh, can I thank Urala for again sponsoring uh, the Urala Media Awards for putting a focus on how people with disability are portrayed in media. Uh, but I should extend a, a very uh, great acknowledgement to the media in Australia who have fundamentally changed the way that people with disability are portrayed. Thankfully, uh, essentially gone are the days uh, when people with disability are portrayed uh, as heroes uh, or uh, as being in crisis. Uh, we want to see people with disability uh, portrayed as just members of the community, sure, who might face a few extra challenges, uh, but they're members of the community like everyone else. Uh, and the Australian media do deserve congratulations for how they have changed their portrayal of people with disability. Uh, I also want to acknowledge uh, the role that the Australian media have played uh, in being champions for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Uh, I think there is a role on occasion uh, for the media to be campaigners. Uh, and the NDIS uh, is a cause, is a venture uh, that has, uh, in part, um, achieved where it has reached today due to the role of the Australian media. So thank you for that. But it's my great pleasure uh, today uh, to announce the winner of the 2013 uh, Urella Media Award for Excellence. Uh, and I'll say a little bit about um, the, uh, the presentation uh, that uh, you may have seen previously. Uh, the award goes to uh, Joe Ameo for the photograph, Little Girl with a Big Impact. And for those who, uh, who may have seen uh, earlier today um, a presentation of the photograph that uh, Joe took, uh, it features Sophie Dean, uh, who developed a special relationship with former Prime Minister Julia Gillard. Uh, the photograph is of uh, Sophie um, with the Prime Minister. Uh, with a photograph that she herself took uh, on her iPad. Uh, and the Prime Minister, when introducing uh, legislation into the Parliament uh, on the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, made very particular mention of Sophie uh, and the effect that Sophie had had uh, on her understanding. Um, Sophie can't be with us today, but I thought I might call up uh, Sophie's mother, uh, Kirsten Dean, who is with us as well. A very proud mother indeed. <laughs> Congratulations to Joe Amaya on that award and, uh, and of course congratulations also to uh, Sophie's mother who obviously has played um, a pretty important role in helping to promote this discussion along with her daughter I guess in terms of that photograph and other issues. Uh, well time now to uh, move to our other event today, the address uh, by the Minister, as I said the Assistant Minister for Social Services, um, also uh, Manager of Government Business uh, in the Upper House in the Senate and the First Minister in this Government to address the Press Club. Please welcome Senator Mitch Firefield. Thank you, uh, Laurie, uh, and uh, can I thank the National Press Club for the leadership that it has provided in giving a platform for social policy, but for disability in particular. Uh, and can I thank Urella for the important work uh, it does, not only in Victoria, uh, but through auspicing today's media awards. 
I should mention uh, at the outset that as the Assistant Minister for Social Services, I'm not only the Minister for Disabilities, uh, but also the Minister for Ageing. Uh, and the other hat I wear in my spare time, uh, has, as has been mentioned, is that of Manager of Government Business in the Senate, uh, which I guess makes me the Senate answer Christopher Pine. <laughs> Take that as you will. Um, <laughs> But the first thing uh, I want to make clear here today is that being the Minister for Disabilities is where I want to be. I was first appointed uh, with responsibility for disabilities for the Coalition uh, by Opposition Leader Malcolm Turnbull in 2009. And after the 2010 election, uh, I indicated to Opposition Leader Tony Abbott that I wanted to retain that responsibility, and he agreed. And upon election to government, uh, I again, this time to Prime Minister Abbott, uh, indicated that I was keen to stay in the role, and he agreed again. And I made that request for a couple of reasons. See, I was pretty typical of people who have assumed front bench roles for disabilities in not having had a particular uh, exposure to people with disability. Uh, I didn't have a friend uh, or a family member uh, with a significant disability. And I had been operating on the assumption, like so many people, that you pay your taxes uh, and if you have a disability, uh, you'd get the support that you need. How wrong was I? And the experience uh, of people with disability has been that no sooner have they trained up a front bencher uh, who has responsibility for disability, but they're moved on to another portfolio. And so the task of educating a minister or a shadow starts all over again. So I was very determined that uh, one of the contributions that I could make and that the coalition could make on assuming office was to provide continuity in terms of front bench office holder so, so that I could put to use um, what I had learned. And recently, uh, a well-known disability advocate, uh, Dr George uh, Talaporis uh, from Melbourne, uh, kindly wrote in an article on the ABC website Ramp Up that I was job ready uh, to be minister. Uh, thank you, George. Um, but the, to the extent that uh, I am job ready, uh, it's thanks to uh, people with disability uh, who have been very patient uh, in educating me. Now, my view is that uh, the role that I currently have will probably be the most important uh, that I will have uh, in my career in public life. And the reason that I have that view is that it's very hard to think of another area, it's very hard to think of another portfolio that has the potential to make such a difference to the quality of life of so many Australians. Now, we're here today and uh, the press club is dedicated today to the subject of disability, partly because we've made so much ground in a relatively short period of time. Disability is no longer seen as a marginal policy area, and this is thanks to Australians with disability who came together with carers and with the organisations that support them, and they said loudly and uh, in one voice, uh, in the words of Peter Finch from the Movie Network, uh, we're mad as hell and we're not going to take it anymore. And that message was heard by the nation's parliaments and was given effect to uh, by governments in every state and territory as well. The NDIS, we've got to remember, is a shared endeavour of all Australian governments. And although it would be fair to say that uh, the last federal parliament was uh, inelegant, uh, there was one unequivocally good thing to come from that parliament and that was cross-party support to ensure that a national disability insurance scheme became a reality. And, and since we last gathered to share these awards, uh, there are now some hundreds of Australians with disability uh, living in NDIS launch sites who have started to receive uh, the better deal that they deserve. But in AFL parlance, uh, we're still very much pre-season. Uh, we're in launch phase. Uh, we've still got a long, long way to go uh, before we see uh, an estimated 460,000 Australians as participants in the NDIS. And I want to make it clear that uh, I could not 
take this responsibility more seriously. Uh, and the Prime Minister, uh, very thoughtfully and kindly uh, in this place at the launch of Carers Week uh, a bit over a month ago, uh, decided he would ramp up the pressure even more. Uh, and he said, and I'll quote, um, it's a big job, Mitch, to the audience, but I know you're up for it. And I know that millions of Australians will be relying on you uh, to get this right. Uh, don't feel daunted, please, Mitch. Um, I do confess, um, I feel daunted uh, and excited in equal measure. Um, but as well as acknowledging the common voice uh, that has got us to this point, uh, I also uh, should acknowledge the thought leadership of uh, Bruce Bonnyhady uh, and John Walsh. I also want to acknowledge uh, Bill Shorten, uh, who did much when he was the Parliamentary Secretary uh, to raise the profile uh, of disability. Uh, and also uh, Kevin Rudd, who was Prime Minister, uh, made the initial referral to the Productivity Commission. But I also want to acknowledge uh, Tony Abbott and before him Malcolm Turnbull, uh, who as leaders have been unstinting in their support of the NDIS uh, and who never thought for a moment to make the NDIS the subject of partisan debate. Which is why the Coalition, uh, without hesitation, supported the work of the Productivity Commission, supported the legislation, supported the Medicare levy increase, supported the launch sites and supported the announced funding. In the words of uh, the Prime Minister, the NDIS is an idea whose time has come. Now, I'm not going to uh, relitigate today uh, the need for an NDIS. Uh, we all know that the system of support for people with disability is broken. But I would like to take a moment to put my own party's support for the NDIS in philosophical context. Uh, yes, uh, it's true that uh, my party sees itself as the, as the party of smaller government, uh, but we don't see ourselves as the party of no government. Uh, and yes, as a political movement, we believe in hard work and reward for effort, but we also believe in helping people who face extra challenges for reasons beyond their control. And the design uh, of the NDIS, at its heart, having the individual at the centre and in control, able to choose the supports of their choice, uh, could not rest more easily uh, with the philosophy of my party. And at a more human level, uh, the Prime Minister has demonstrated his own personal commitment to Australians with disability by raising over $1.2 million through the 2012 and 2013 polypedal charity bike rides for Carers Australia. And each year along that uh, thousand kilometre route, uh, he has met uh, with people with disability, carers and the organisations that support them. And the next polypedal, uh, I'm pleased to say, will also be in partnership with and raise funds for Carers Australia. So the Prime Minister's own commitment uh, isn't just professional uh, in this area, it's personal. But at a more corporate level, my view and the view of the government is that assisting people who face extra challenges for reasons beyond their control should be the core business of government. And part of what we want to do as a government is to get back to focusing on the things that should be core business. Because the more the government spends time on things that aren't core business, the more its attention is distracted and diverted from the fundamental to the merely desirable, and the more its resources are expended on the non-core. And for me, this explains uh, why, over decades, disability was neglected, because government was too distracted uh, on things that were less important. The attention of government had been diverted. And that's why uh, our Commission of Audit, for instance, has as one of its principles that, and I quote, government should do for people what they cannot do or cannot do efficiently for themselves, but no more. The more that government does for people those things uh, that they can do for themselves, the less capacity government has to do for people the things that they can't do for themselves. And for me and for this government and for our Prime Minister, uh, the NDIS is core business. It is a priority. So I want to be absolutely clear. Uh, we will make the NDIS a reality. Uh, it is a vast undertaking uh, and we will continue the rollout of the NDIS in line with the Productivity Commission vision 
uh, as detailed by the intergovernmental agreements with the states and territories. Now, in opposition, uh, I was always at pains to try and elevate the NDIS above the partisan fray. Because people with disabilities and their families, quite rightly, have a very low threshold for petty partisan point scoring in this area. Uh, they just want us to fix the system. And that's why, in opposition, all our comments, um, all our statements, all our questions uh, were couched in terms of being constructive, uh, trying to help the NDIS be the best that it can be. Now, bipartisanship uh, at its worst uh, can be invoked by one side as an excuse uh, to try and escape scrutiny from the other side. But bipartisanship at its best can achieve uh, important national outcomes. And that's the type of bipartisanship that the nation and Australians with disability deserve when it comes to the NDIS. To this end, uh, the government will be re-establishing a joint parliamentary committee on the NDIS. Uh, this was a proposal that the coalition put forward for more than a year uh, before it was belatedly embraced by the former government uh, towards the end of their term. Uh, the committee uh, will serve, uh, I hope, as a non-partisan oversight committee. Uh, it is not uncommon uh, in areas of uncontested policy for parliamentary oversight committees to operate in a non-partisan fashion. That's the case with Commonwealth law enforcement and defence bodies. Uh, why should it be any different uh, with a social policy agency uh, that's universally embraced? The committee will serve as a symbol of unity uh, and, importantly, it'll also provide a forum uh, where questions uh, about design can be asked in a way that's not seen to be partisan. We envisage the uh, Oversight Committee uh, playing an important role in examining the experience in the NDIS launch sites uh, and ensuring that uh, the Productivity Commission's blueprint is realised. The NDIS uh, is uh, a major endeavour. Uh, there will be, uh, inevitably, uh, some changes along the way. As a new government, uh, we bring an open mind to looking at issues that will emerge from the launch sites. Uh, we want to learn from the launch sites. We want to learn from people with disability in the Barwon, in the Hunter, in Tasmania and in South Australia. To get this right is going to require a high level of consultation and attention to detail. Uh, not just now, not just in the launches, uh, but through to full completion. And the Parliamentary Oversight Committee, uh, I hope, uh, will lock in that cross-party support over the three parliaments that it will take to fully implement the scheme. Now, there's one thing that I do need to do uh, as Minister uh, for the NDIS, and that is to address the issue of expectations. With the NDIS, no one is served by hype, exaggeration or glossy materials that convey little information. Explanation of the NDIS should be characterised by facts. And the starting point should be what the NDIS is and what the NDIS is not. The NDIS is not designed to provide direct support for all Australians with disability. On some measures, there are over, 400, uh, there are over 4 million Australians with some form of disability. The NDIS will uh, aim to provide entitlements for aids, equipment, personal attendant care and other non-income supports to around 460,000 Australians with significant non-age related disabilities. The objective of the NDIS is to address chronic unmet need of a group of people who have been under supported for decades. And a few examples uh, include uh, children who are waiting for wheelchairs currently for a couple of years, adults with mobility impairment only able to bathe a few times each week, and adults with intellectual impairment uh, unable to get support or accommodation uh, and whose parents, understandably, uh, are greatly concerned. It's my very strong view that there uh, can be and must be uh, no repeat of the multi-million dollar nationwide NDIS television advertising campaign that we witnessed in the weeks before the last election was called. Uh, I think this did a great disservice to Australians with disability. There was certainly a need to communicate to potential NDIS participants in the launch sites that commenced on the 1st of July, but $22 million on a national campaign 
for a scheme that won't itself be national until 2019-20 was excessive. The television advertising contained no details about eligibility. Uh, the ads gave the impression that the scheme was already in place and that everyone was covered. Uh, this should never happen again, uh, and it is an object lesson for all governments. The $22 million uh, that I referred to um, was also used to rebrand the NDIS as Disability Care Australia, uh, a name that uh, was widely disliked by people with disability. Uh, the new names, uh, the, new, the new name I think was uh, at odds with the NDIS vision of choice uh, and independence. Uh, People with disability uh, don't want to be objects of care. Uh, they want to be supported uh, to be as independent as they can, uh, which is why I, I've directed the NDIS agency to revert to the name NDIS. The return uh, to the name NDIS has uh, two purposes. But the first is to leave behind, as I said, uh, a name that was uh, disliked and didn't reflect uh, the intention of the scheme. The second purpose was to reinforce and to underline the insurance principles of the scheme by having this reflected in the name. Uh, the scheme is about value for money, uh, support on a needs basis, a strong actuarial focus and minimising costs over time through early intervention. Uh, the NDIS has been instructed to take a low cost and no frills approach to reverting to the NDIS name. Um, advertising uh, should have been targeted at launch sites uh, and detailed eligibility rather than following the familiar government advertising pattern of a slogan and a reference uh, to a website. Uh, my message, if, uh, if you hadn't picked it up by now, uh, is that um, we've got to uh, realistically address expectations and that any information the government puts out, that the agency puts out, has got to be factual and unadorned. Um, and while I'm talking about expectations, no one should be under the illusion that the NDIS uh, can do it all. Uh, in line with the National Disability Strategy, uh, not to be confused with the National Disability Insurance Scheme, uh, our expectation <coughs> pardon me, is that all Australian governments, non-government organisations, business and the wider community will continue to have a role in disability. Uh, what this means in the context of the NDIS is that uh, there will be no excuse for other systems failing to provide the same standard of support for people with disability as for other Australians. Uh, the scheme will not be replacing the health system. The scheme will not be replacing uh, state transport responsibilities. Uh, the NDIS can't do everything and all governments need to maintain efforts outside the NDIS for people with disability. Now there is a warning uh, that uh, I need to sound today and that is to highlight the danger of politics as usual in relation to the NDIS uh, and I'll limit myself to, to one case study. Uh, during the election campaign, uh, Labor released a series of, of what I call phantom NDIS rollout schedules in marginal seats. Uh, these were, um, I'll be blunt, uh, stunts aimed to mislead. The previous minister, uh, during the election, in the caretaker period, and without the knowledge, consent or agreement of partner state governments, went from key seat to key seat, announcing that each area was going to be the next to benefit from the NDIS rollout. And since the election, uh, Ms Macklin has been going from area to area, stating that the coalition was not going to honour these rollout agreements. Um, now let me provide a few facts. Uh, no government, uh, whether in election period or out of election period, can unilaterally declare a rollout program. Fact, the NDIS is a joint venture of Commonwealth, State and Territory governments and the detail of rollout schedule beyond the launch sites will be determined cooperatively by all governments. Fact, the Coalition is honouring the agreements between the Commonwealth and the States and the Territories as was always our intention. But for the previous minister to try and pass off campaign press releases as duly negotiated Commonwealth state bilateral agreements and then, post-election, to accuse the coalition of reneging on agreements that never existed is, quite frankly, appalling. 
And recently, uh, Ms Macklin has even gone so far as to say that the Coalition was no longer committed to the full rollout of the NDIS. My message to the opposition is, come on, um, don't do this. Um, don't take advantage of fear. Uh, don't take advantage of apprehension. Uh, surely there is one area uh, of public policy. Uh, surely there is one portfolio um, where we don't have to play these games. So um, I hope uh, it was an aberration. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, no address about the NDIS is complete without talking about funding. Uh, this is a massive venture. Uh, it's among the most serious and complex reform uh, Australian governments have ever sought to undertake. Uh, the NDIS in full rollout uh, will have a gross cost of $22 billion per annum. Uh, and an additional contribution uh, will be required from the Commonwealth uh, at full rollout in 2019-20 of $8 billion. Now these are large numbers, uh, even for an economy as robust as ours. Uh, but the numbers are what the numbers are, uh, and they reflect unmet need and decades of neglect. But I again uh, want to underline the strength of the Coalition's commitment to the NDIS. Uh, you will remember uh, that we didn't propose the increase in the Medicare levy. Uh, you'll remember that we thought the levy increase would not have been necessary had the previous government prioritised differently. But we voted for it. And we did so because we didn't think that Australians with disability should miss out on the better deal that they deserve due to what we saw as poor decisions by the previous government. Uh, that wouldn't have passed the fair go test. Uh, we wanted the NDIS to become a reality. But I want to make a, a broader point. And that is that um, economic and social policy uh, are not alternatives. Uh, they're not in competition. Uh, a good economic policy is needed to support a good social policy. Uh, they are two sides of uh, the one coin. Uh, without careful economic management, no government can make provision for good social policy. To put it uh, simply, uh, prudent fiscal management is not the enemy of the NDIS. Uh, and the NDIS is not the enemy of prudent, prudent fiscal management. Uh, we, as a government, are for both. As I've said, uh, the launch in the four sites across Australia does provide an opportunity to learn from experience. And the purpose is to learn. The purpose is for design features to be tested and changed if needed. And the launch is an opportunity to check our assumptions and to revise implementation plans. As much as Australians support the NDIS, they also expect it to be implemented efficiently and well. Uh, and I'll be upfront, uh, there will be issues that emerge during launch, um, but they need not cause alarm, uh, but they do need to be addressed. And today's uh, press club occasion uh, does give me an opportunity to present an update on the scheme and some of the emerging trends. Could I firstly uh, commend uh, the independent board of the National Disability Insurance Agency uh, who are stewarding uh, this great venture? And can I acknowledge the great strides that have been made uh, by the dedicated staff at the agency uh, who are working and have worked to incredibly compressed timeframes? Um, you might recall that the Productivity Commission uh, recommended that the NDIS be launched in mid-2014. Uh, but that the previous government decided the launch should happen a year earlier, in July 2013. Um, there may have been a certain event in September that had something to do with that change of uh, plan. Uh, but anyway, um, the staff have truly worked wonders. Uh, and I've got to say, uh, as I've moved around and met them, uh, the staff at the agency uh, really uh, displayed the best qualities of the Australian Public Service. So. Where are we at? So far, uh, we have four launch sites that have commenced. Uh, eight offices have opened. Uh, 500 staff have been engaged. Uh, and there are now people who were previously on waiting lists who are getting the support that they need. Uh, I've met scheme participants who have, uh, in their own words, uh, said that now they have the supports they need, uh, their life have been transformed in a fundamental way. 
Now, confidence uh, in the NDIS, I believe, uh, is going to be built on transparency. So today, uh, I want to start that process. Uh, I want to share with you uh, what I know. Uh, I want the NDIS to be an open book to the Australian people. Uh, we have had so far uh, one full quarter uh, of the NDIS operation. So as of the 30th of June, uh, there were 921 people in the scheme with completed plans. Uh, although uh, there are still uh, a number of plans in progress, uh, I should acknowledge, that the bilateral agreement with the states uh, had a target of 2,208 people uh, for that period. So the number of participants is under half of what was anticipated at this stage. Uh, I can also report that the number of people registering interest in participating in the scheme across the launch sites is 3,222. Uh, that's almost 50% more than the expected number of participants uh, for the first quarter. Uh, in addition, uh, I should uh, report that plan costs are exceeding modelled average costs by around 30%. Now, what this means in dollar terms is that instead of coming out at the expected average package cost of $34,969, as based on the work of the Productivity Commission, they're currently costing uh, $46,290 for the first quarter. So to summarise, uh, completing plans is taking longer than expected. Uh, demand so far uh, is greater than expected and package costs are higher. Now I emphasise, uh, these are early trends uh, and the scheme is still uh, in the uh, preliminary stages of launch. Uh, and the agency itself is undertaking detailed work to see if there are some unique launch reasons uh, for these early trends. Uh, let me emphasise again, uh, this is uh, only the first quarter uh, and uh, we won't be uh, complete uh, in terms of the target date for full NDIS until 2019-20. Uh, but I think it's important to be upfront about the state of play uh, and the Commonwealth uh, with the agency and our state and territory partners uh, will work issues through. Uh, I am determined, absolutely determined, be in no doubt to see the NDIS delivered in full, to see the NDIS a reality. First and foremost, uh, for the 460,000 Australians who will be directly supported through the NDIS but there's another group uh, that I don't want to let down, uh, and they are the staff of the National Disability Insurance Agency. As I mentioned, I've met with the staff uh, here in Canberra uh, and in Geelong and shortly in the other launch sites. Um, they all have one thing in common. Uh, like me, uh, they are where they want to be, uh, doing what they want to do. Uh, they've worked incredible hours. They've created a scheme from scratch. They have a passion and they know that they're taking part in one of the most important things they'll do in their professional lives. And they, like me, are determined to deliver for Australians with disability. We need to make sure that the NDIS is here to stay. We need to make sure that its foundations are strong. We won't leave Australians with disability wondering about whether reform of the magnitude of the NDIS will be able to stand the test of time. We'll make sure it can. We need to give them certainty that services provided under the NDIS are here to stay, and stay they are. And that's what everything I do in relation to the NDIS is about. The NDIS will be uh, a transformation. It will be uh, nothing short of a new deal for Australians with disability. Uh, we've got to get it right. So I say, uh, let the NDIS be above politics. Let the NDIS be an open book. Let's learn the lessons as we go. Uh, there will be challenges, uh, but we can and we will achieve it together. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Senator Fifield. Now I'm now for our usual round of questions from our media members, and the first one today is from David Spears. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Minister, thank you for your address uh, and the update on some of those early figures as well. In, in the interest of that transparency, can I ask um, the idea of outsourcing the administration or part of the uh, administrative responsibilities to Medibank or putting it to tender for someone else? Um, what's the latest on that thinking? Have you considered it further? Will this indeed be something that that parliamentary committee you've also touched on today uh, will decide on or is this a call for, uh, for you alone? Sure, thanks, David. Well, the, the, the parliamentary committee will have fairly broad terms of reference, so uh, they will pretty much uh, be able to uh, report uh, and inquire uh, as they choose to. So, so that's essentially a, a matter for them. Um, I think you're probably uh, referring to uh, my, my colleague, um, Joe Hockey, um, and some comments that he made um, a week or two back. Uh, I've got to say, I, I think uh, the comments that Joe made were uh, self-evident uh, and unremarkable. Um, uh, there is nothing to stop any organisation at the moment, including Medibank Private, from putting themselves forward uh, to be a provider of disability services. Uh, contestability is at the heart of the NDIS, and where contestability happens is where an individual is assessed, they get their entitlement, and then they can then choose uh, the provider of their choice. Now, nothing to stop Medibank Private if they want to go into the, the personal attendant care business, for instance, uh, or the aids and equipment business, uh, or some other area. Nothing to stop them from doing that. Uh, the other side of things is um, the NDIS uh, agency itself. Um, it may well be, uh, in the light of experience in the launch sites, that the NDIS board decides that there are some functions that they undertake in-house uh, that they would want to contract out. Um, and if they took that decision, uh, whatever it would be contracted out would be done so uh, on, a, on a contested and competitive basis. Uh, but uh, look, that's a, that's, a, that's a matter for the NDIS board. Uh, but I should emphasise that uh, uh, contestability is at the heart of the NDIS and where that happens uh, is it's not government, it's not the NDIS agency that provide direct supports to people with disability, um, it's uh, private service providers, uh, it's not for profits uh, who do that uh, and uh, the, the more providers there are uh, in that space so the better the choice uh, and uh, the better the options for people with disability. If I just might ask a follow-up question uh, to David before I go back to the floor. Uh, you, in the interest of transparency, you did say in your speech that there would be changes along the way. You'd learn from your experiences. Is there anything that you would foreshadow at this stage? <clears throat> Not, not immediately, uh, Laurie. Um, uh, I say we're going to be um, uh, open to change because that is the very purpose of, uh, of the launch sites, uh, is to uh, look at interface issues between the NDIS and the aged care system, interface issues between the NDIS uh, and the health system. Uh, there may well need to be adjustments uh, on the way. Uh, we're not uh, yet at that point uh, where we uh, can identify uh, any adjustments that need to be made. It's uh, still only the first quarter uh, of the scheme, uh, but that is where the role of the parliamentary committee will be very important. Uh, and as I said in my uh, remarks, uh, I think it's very important that there is a forum uh, where members of parliament can ask questions where they can be probing in a way that won't be seen to be partisan. Um, in the ordinary course of events up on the hill, uh, if you're an opposition figure and you ask a question of the government about a particular program, it is inevitably seen as a criticism. Uh, it is inevitably seen as an attack. Uh, and we want to have an environment uh, where uh, good and probing questions uh, can, be, uh, can be posed uh, in a way that's not seen to be a, an attack. If we don't have that sort of forum, um, we're, we're not going to achieve uh, the sort of outcome that we want. Uh, we want to be able to put partisanship aside so that we can get together across the aisle uh, and make the scheme the best that it can be. Next question from Dan Harrison. G'day, Senator. Dan Harrison from The Age and the Sydney Morning Herald. I'd like to ask you a question about your other area of responsibility being aged care. The previous Labor government legislated to uh, remove an exemption that had allowed faith-based aged care providers to uh, deny beds to people on the grounds of their sexual orientation. Um, that was a change that the Coalition opposed. The Coalition said it was a violation of religious freedom. Do you propose to reverse that change and reinstate that exemption? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, look, I, I'm not aware of, uh, of any proposition to change what has passed through the parliament, uh, but um, I am going to uh, step aside on this um, and say that the uh, Disability Discrimination Act formally falls under the Attorney-General, uh, and the Attorney-General is very proprietorial uh, about his legislation. Uh, but uh, uh, let me say I'm not aware of any, any plans for change. Andrew Tillett. Andrew Tillett from the West Australian Minister. You talked a bit about um, the, the costs of the scheme and, uh, and in the first quarter about the costs being 30% um, higher than modelled. You also mentioned too that you were opposed to the, uh, the Medicare levy uh, increase in opposition when it was um, came in. Well, not, no, sorry, you didn't oppose it. You we, we voted for it. You voted we for supported it. it. You, didn't, yeah, you, did, yeah. you didn't see it necessary. Apologies. You didn't see it necessary. In light, though, the fact that the uh, budget has deteriorated in Joe Hockey's own words, do we need to maybe reconsider and, and look at maybe going with a bigger Medicare uh, levy increase? And also, too, is there scope to introduce sort of um, co-payments and means testing for the scheme as we do with sort of other welfare and health mm -hmm. schemes like Medicare, um, family allowances, those sorts of things? Sure. Oh. I'll take the, the second part first. Uh, the Productivity Commission was very clear that they didn't think that there should be means testing or co-payments for uh, the NDIS. Um, and there's a, there's a good reason for that. Um, disability isn't something that you can necessarily plan for. Um, uh, you can be born with a disability, uh, you can acquire a disability unexpe unexpectedly. Uh, where we have um, means testing and co-payments, uh, it tends to be in areas where um, you know, you've got a reasonable chance of, of perhaps planning for the eventuality. So um, in aged care, for instance, um, you know, there, are, uh, there are means testings, there are, there are daily fees um, because um, ageing is something that um, you can plan for. You know, hopefully, um, uh, that's going to be an eventuality that befalls you. So, uh, so I think uh, we've got to distinguish uh, the nature of, of disability uh, and uh, how disability is acquired. Uh, in relation to the Medicare levy, um, we didn't propose the Medicare levy increase. Um, we didn't think that it should have been necessary. Uh, we think that the previous government should have prioritised differently. Uh, and, uh, and made provision for it. Uh, they didn't, uh, but we saw as the, the higher objective and the higher goal to see the NDIS become a reality. So as I said before, uh, although we, uh, we, we didn't propose the levy, uh, don't think it should have been necessary, um, we didn't think that it should be Australians with disability who miss out because of decisions uh, by the, uh, the previous government. So we voted to support it. Uh, the Medicare levy uh, will cover, um, over the forward estimates, uh, the Commonwealth's additional contribution to the scheme. Um, over time, though, uh, the Medicare levy won't cover uh, the full uh, Commonwealth contribution because uh, the levy contributions remain pretty much the same, uh, but the scheme costs ramp up as you move towards full implementation. Um, so. Uh, there will be a task for government to identify savings uh, to, uh, to fill that gap between what the Medicare levy will raise uh, and uh, the cost of the full scheme. Uh, Nicholas Stewart. Oh, g'day, thanks very much. I, I was particularly impressed by w your opening remarks, the fact that you eschewed any desire for personal advancement and that, that's why you were following up this scheme. After all, uh, it, it was only people like Bill Shorten who had it before you. I don't know whether or not that shows anything about your ambitions after all. Uh, <laughs> I'm in the wrong. Uh, I'm in the wrong house to have that uh, that that strange, uh, you know, delusion that uh, I should serve the nation. Sorry. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Senator. Uh, what what I, I last week I was at the the uh, meeting of Brain Injury Australia. Now you made the point that quite appropriately this scheme is to um, hands the money and the power back to the individual with the disability. What happens, though, about organisations like Brain Injury Australia that employ two people uh, uh, to, to raise systemic awareness of uh, a condition and an injury? Um, what, what is your situation? Will you continue funding organisations like that, or are you going to pull money at, at the moment? They, they don't have any funding uh, post next year. 
Sure, thank you. I'm not aware of the particular funding arrangements for, for brain injury uh, and um, whether their, their funding currently comes through Department of Social Services or, or the health portfolio. Um, but organisations who receive uh, money for, uh, for advocacy and for research will continue to receive money uh, in the way they have previously. Uh, the, the NDIS uh, will change the funding arrangements for uh, organisations who are in the business of uh, direct service delivery. Um, uh, many of those organisations uh, currently receive funding on a block basis. Uh, it varies, uh, it varies uh, state by state and it varies whether it's a Commonwealth or a, uh, or a state program. Uh, there are some jurisdictions like Victoria uh, who have moved a fair way down the path of, uh, of individualised funding. Uh, but the, uh, the onus will be uh, on those organisations who are in the business of service delivery uh, to, uh, to demonstrate uh, that they're good at what they do uh, and uh, to um, uh, put their wares uh, before uh, potential uh, customers. Uh, so that is a change uh, and that will take some adjustment for service providers, uh, which is why uh, the scheme is designed to commence with launch sites uh, so that we can see what some of the issues and difficulties are uh, for service provision organisations in Geelong, in the Hunter, uh, as, they, as they make that transition. Um, so that's, again, uh, it's a reason uh, why we have the launches, so that if there are adjustments that, uh, that need to be made, uh, we can certainly make those. So how has that played out? Because there were concerns about uh, short-term cash flow impact uh, on um, those agencies, you know, the ability to actually maintain their staffing levels as that transition occurred. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's a it's a challenge for uh, for organisations. They've they've got to work out new billing systems, new invoicing systems. Uh, will they be paid at a different time of the month uh, to when they were previously paid? Uh, and some uh, some service providers uh, have uh, found that difficult, uh, but. Uh, you know, we're, we're there to, uh, to learn the lessons uh, from, from the launch areas. Question now from Nance Haxton. Minister, I have a question on a separate issue regarding uh, the issue of justice for people with an intellectual disability. It's been estimated that people with an intellectual disability are up to seven times more likely to be sexually abused in the community. A number of my stories have found that uh, a number of cases of sexual abuse have fallen over before getting to court because of problems with evidence and that the courts essentially see them as unreliable witnesses. Uh, one particular case, seven children were allegedly abused by the same man but because they couldn't speak uh, the court case fell over. Uh, is it time for you to uh, work with the Federal Attorney General to look at this issue, to take a national approach, uh, to, to lobby state attorneys generals, as each state has different laws of evidence, to stop pedophiles targeting this vulnerable group when they know it's so unlikely they can be brought to justice? Sure. No, no thank you. Uh, and, and it's... Uh it's an issue that uh, that's been raised with me uh, frequently. Uh, you know, as as you point out, uh, it's uh, it's a matter that's uh, more directly uh, for uh, federal and state attorneys general. Um, but I, I take a, a pretty broad view in terms of, uh, of my responsibilities uh, in this portfolio. Um, uh, for instance, uh, you know, I don't see myself as only disabilities minister. I also see myself as an employment minister uh, when it comes to people uh, with disabilities, which is why some of those responsibilities have come from DWA to us. So um, although uh, you know, this issue of um, uh, evidence in relation to people who uh, have been uh, abused um, doesn't fall directly under me. Um, I'm very happy to, uh, to talk to, um, uh, to the attorney um, and the attorney state and federal. Um, and did you, uh, did you win a Urala Award again this year? Yes. You did? Well, congratulations. <laughs> um, fantastic. Um, I, I should just, uh, just in addition to um, uh, the, the, the previous question, um, one of the reasons why um, uh, I, I laboured the point perhaps about um, not hyping uh, too much what the NDIS will do is because the more people think that the NDIS does everything, the less likely they will be to continue to put their hand in their pockets and to donate. Uh, to, to organisations uh, such as the one you mentioned. Uh, and I know that's a particular concern uh, of, uh, of, of guide dog organisations um, is uh, at the moment uh, most of their budget uh, comes from fundraising and they're very concerned that um, if people think the NDIS does everything, um, people will stop donating to organisations such as them. Uh, Lisa Martin. 
Lisa Martin from Australian Associated Press. Minister, are you aware of the Oscar-nominated film The Sessions, uh, in which Helen Hunt plays a, a sex surrogate who helps a disabled man? Uh, there's been calls um, from some people within the disability sector that uh, the NDIS should cover sex uh, services for people with disabilities. The NDIS rules are, are quite vague on uh, whether this is covered. I'm just wondering whether you would be comfortable with uh, sex therapy being included in some people's NDIS plan if that's their choice. Thanks very much, Lisa. Um, <laughs> uh, I haven't seen the movie. Uh, I am aware of it. Um, th this issue has, uh, has come up before. Uh, when uh, the Senate was having public hearings uh, into the NDIS legislation, uh, this particular proposition uh, was, was put. Um, would the sorts of services that you mentioned um, qualify uh, as as reasonable and necessary, um, and I'm I'm not going to um, uh, I guess give uh, give a, a, an on the spot ruling, uh, but um, uh, but what I but what I will say is um, the NDIS uh, isn't there um, to provide um, a range of things which individuals, whether they have a disability or not. Um, might seek to have as part of their life. Uh, it's there to uh, provide supports uh, so that they can do uh, and achieve things um, which are made uh, a little more difficult uh, because of the disability uh, that they had. Um, uh, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the comments there, um, partly because, you know, um, I, I don't, I don't want to have um, you know, a headline that says, you know, Minister says X, Y, Z is in. Um, shock horror. Um, uh, so um, I'm going to leave it there uh, because the, the essence of uh, the NDIS is working on a plan for an individual. Uh, is what are the goals, what are the plans, what are the objectives for an individual? Um, and each plan uh, will be different. Uh, each plan will be personalised. Um, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Henrietta Cook. Thanks for your address, Senator. Disability advocates were outraged when the government's business advisor, Morris Newman, described the NDIS as worthy and a good cause, but said it was a scheme that risked jeopardising the economy. I was wondering what your response was to those claims. Well, uh, the NDIS uh, is worthy, uh, and the NDIS uh, is uh, a good cause. Uh, but uh, the NDIS, um, as I said, earlier. Um, uh, I don't see it as the enemy of, um, of, of good and prudent uh, fiscal management, um, and good and prudent fiscal management um, isn't the enemy um, of the NDIS. Maura Byrne. I'm, from, uh, I'm a freelance writer but also a disability stakeholder. Um, the NDIS, NDIS will meet a basic level of support for people with a disability, but how does the government plan to address the significant underrepresentation of people with disability and caregivers in Australian workplaces, particularly the public service? Sure, thank you. Um, and you raise you raise a good point about uh, the public service and the, uh, the the numbers of people with disability who who work in the public service. Uh, the Australian Public Service Commissioner, uh, who who keeps the numbers on this, uh, has demonstrated uh, that over the last five or ten years, uh, the numbers have been going backwards. Uh, that concerns me because I think it's important for government to lead by example uh, when it comes to the employment of people with disabilities. Uh, I should uh, should acknowledge uh, some some good work uh, that happened in the former um, Faxia department, uh, which uh, established a cadetship program uh, for young school leavers with um, intellectual impairment. Um, uh, that's a, a cadetship that I would like to see expanded across the, the public sector, uh, and I know that there are other Commonwealth government departments and agencies uh, that have, um, uh, have taken a look at that and are starting to, to put it in place. Um, in relation to carers, um, uh, this is uh, something that we sought to highlight uh, in uh, the launch of Carers Week. Um, uh, 
carers because of their responsibilities um, uh, often uh, have to work part time. Uh, often uh, will need to take uh, parts of uh, parts of the day um, off and away from the office. Uh, but uh, I want to speak up in support of carers because if you've got significant caring responsibilities, um, you've become a terrific multitasker. Uh, you're someone uh, who knows how to juggle uh, competing deadlines. Uh, you're someone who knows that uh, I may have to head off early tomorrow, so I better get done today what I need to do tomorrow. Uh, so I think employers uh, should look very favourably uh, towards carers. Um, but more broadly, um, uh, with uh, disability and, uh, and employment, um, uh, it was very much front of mind uh, as we were putting together the new Department of Social Services. Uh, previously, responsibility for employment issues for people with disability was split uh, between the old Faxia uh, and uh, DWA. Um, I wanted to bring that together and have brought together responsibility for open employment um, and supported employment uh, in the one department, social services, under the one minister, me, so we can give a more intensive focus to it. Uh, but ultimately, uh, when it comes to employment, um, it's all, it's all about the employers, and what I want to do is highlight um, uh, those employers who are actually doing the right thing. You know, we give employers a bad name, but there are some employers doing the right thing, and I hope he doesn't mind me mentioning, but there's a fellow by the name of Bruce Parker uh, who runs an engineering business uh, in Dandenong uh, called HM Gem, reconditions um, engines. Uh, and uh, he's a former army commando. That's how he became interested in um, of people who've acquired disabilities. And he just took a decision without any government program that he wanted to employ people with disabilities, not necessarily a service background. So when you walk on his shop floor and you talk to his staff, you soon realise that he has uh, lots of staff with profound hearing impairments, uh, lots of staff with intellectual impairments, uh, lots of staff who are non-verbal. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he has um, been a, a good employer um, and they're loyal um, uh, and they stay with him. Um, and the message is, um, uh, if you do the right thing by a person with disability or a carer um, as an employer, um, they'll do the right thing by you.